congratulations, everyone got a free quantum computer. Did you even know that? Do you know how it works? Do you know how to upgrade the operating system? Do you know how to get the most out of it? We're gonna explore this and many other ridiculous analogies on today's episode of The Coleman Nation. Welcome back, everybody. that when you're born you're given a free quantum computer that lasts about 80 years and has nearly unlimited computing and storage power well i thought that was really incredible obviously i didn't really think about those things when i was born but i grew up working in the computer field i studied computers and technology i worked as a website designer a website programmer uh, and a computer systems manager. I studied for a time to become a software engineer. I really didn't go down that career path, but one of the things that I had to do is I had to understand how computers work. And the fact of the matter is, is that they have a very, very basic logic system, which is called binary logic. I think most of us know how this works, especially in today's day and age of technology. You got zeros and you got ones, and all of the information within a computer is just a series of zeros and ones that give you all the different colors and all the different data and all the different music and everything on, you know, in your cell phone and all your emails. Everything is just a series of zeros and ones. So let's explore the three different types of logic systems that are, that are at work in computers and in ourselves. The first one is called single value logic. That means that there's only one answer. A lot of authoritarianism uh, uses this where there is no other opinion. There's only one answer. It's yes, and that is it. There's no other way to, uh, it, uh, to process it, and there's no other even thought that some other answer could exist. This is a way that has controlled people for many, many years is that they have no right to think, okay? And so if you could imagine a computer that that's the only thing that it spit out, that it had hardwired into it, that this was the answer and there were no other answers, that would be called a single valued logic machine. The next type of logic that's out there is called binary logic, and that's where you have two values. And obviously, those two values within computers are zeros and ones. Each one of those things winds up putting a position where you can have zero and zero, and then zero and one, and one and zero, and then you add up many, many positions of zeros and ones, and this winds up creating all the data in all the computers all over the planet is just an assembly of zeros and ones. And so this is what creates all the many colors on your computer screen. This is what creates this video. This is what you know creates all of the information on your cell phones, all the music that you listen to, every email that you get. It all has to do with binary logic. At the end of the day, it all rolls back to zeros and ones. But is there another type of logic? Is there a, you know, a tertiary or a three-valued logic system? Actually, there could be. And so what we're looking at here is you've got a zero and you've got a one and you've got a maybe, right? And so that could be a three value logic system. But as you start to explore all the various sort of shades, why is quantum computing so important? What exactly is quanta and why is this important for us to understand the tool that we've been given, you know, since birth, this body, this calculating machine, why is it important to know this? What exactly is a quanta? Well, if you look at the different definitions, you know, one definition is a particle of light. Another definition is uh, the existence of uh, something that can be in multiple uh, states at the same time. So there's nothing really too complicated about that, you know, and, and what do we talk about this? Well, let's give an example. Is there a food that you like in one form that you don't like in another form? Uh, case in point, let's say that it's chocolate. You know, some people, they love dark chocolate, but they hate light chocolate, right? They hate, uh, they want, they love chocolate ice cream, but they don't like chocolate milk, right? And so you sit there and you go, wow, there's lots of different ways. I can exist liking chocolate in many different forms and many different states. 
And in fact, could you imagine yourself liking, you know, let's say there's a form of chocolate that you don't like. Let's say you don't like dark chocolate or you don't like milk chocolate. And you say, okay, well, could you imagine yourself being in a position where you do like that thing? Right. And so what happens is instantaneously we have this incredible computing machine that we're running that allows us to think in things in different states. And so what happens, why does this become so important is because if you could imagine that you have, a, you know, a computer in, in it has a zero and it has a one and it has all these varying states of, you know, that it could be a three or it could be a seven and it could keep all of those different pieces of data it instantaneously accessible in every multiple different state that it could be, then what happens is that you could get to like, let's say you have a, for the sake of this example, you have a 10 valued logic system. Well, in one single piece of data, you have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And so it could be any one of those things. Think about the exponential values by just adding another digit that you could have, it exponentially increases all of the different possibilities. And so this is why quantum computing is really, really important is because the speed and the accessibility of the information becomes nearly infinite. And so the power of these computers is going to become very, very strong as we start to explore how these computers work and we start to break technology, you know, have breakthroughs in technology regarding quantum computing, it's gonna be very, very incredible. And let's and another example is be be you know various shades of gray. If you look at a spectrum, right, there's one piece of light that can be broken down into many many different you know layers of light, all the way from you know red to blue, green, purple, yellow, all of these different shades. And there's literally infinite values of light because there's infinite wavelengths of light, you know. And and so what happens is that you have many many different states. Uh, you know, for light, which is really uh, quite fascinating. And so this adva advancement allows a machine to have incredible nuance in relationship to the data that it's processing. So when I say quantum computers, all I'm talking about is a logic system that goes beyond zeros and ones, goes, goes beyond a single valued authoritarianism system, and it winds up putting you in a position where you can think of things in multiple states all at the same time. And if you really think, I mean, a, a friend of mine once said, do you ever think about what you think about? And I, that really got me ironically thinking about what I think about. And I was thinking, wow, I can make many, many different decisions. I can actually hold many different possibilities. You know, have you ever decided that you were going to uh, 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 go out and, um, you know, go to a restaurant and immediately in your mind, you know that there's one place that you're going to go to eat. There's one, ultimately, you're going to wind up in reality, in objective reality, you're going to arrive at one place that you're going to go eat. But in your mind, you can think of every single place that you've ever eaten from the beginning of time all the way until imagined places that you've never even been to and places that you would love to be able to go to. And in your mind, you can think of all of those places and hold them all simultaneously as you file through and decide which one that you want to go to, which restaurant that you want to go to. Right. And so this is really what quantum computing can do is it can hold many pieces of data at once in many different states in order to be completely and instantaneously accessible. And this is very, very exciting for technological advances in the future. Obviously, it also becomes a little bit scary with uh, artificial intelligence. But, you know, the whole point of this talk today is to talk about actual intelligence, living intelligence, which is us. And, uh, and what we can do to upgrade ourselves and upgrade our own operating systems. So let's talk about, finally, to end this little section about the different types of logic. What are the different types of logic? Well, there's single value logic, which is authoritarianism. There's binary logic, which is zeros and ones, yes and no, on or off, right? There's a tertiary logic, which is yes, no, maybe, right? And then there's the last one, which has many, many different forms you know, along an entire spectrum, what we've just given the example of is called infinity valued logic. It, it means that you can have an infinite number of states that a piece of information, just like our restaurant example, is that you can have many, many states in which something can exist, right? And so that concept of infinity valued logic, I think is probably the easiest way to understand what quantum computing is and what it could be is infinity valued logic. Now, 
we as human beings already have this hardwired into way that we th- to the way that we think our own subjective uh, realities that we have is actually completely in infinity valued logic system. And so I think about it and I go, man, what a powerful, powerful machine that we've been given, you know, from when we're born, we occupy this machine that has this logic system that is far in advance of anything that we have even created or have, uh, you know, could think about. And that's one of the the, the tricks it, that that uh, gets sort of played on us is that we think, oh, wow, you know, these, these uh, devices are so, you know, your cell phone and, uh, you know, your car and your computer and, and all these different types of things are uh, these incredible um, machines. And f- in all honesty, they are. But re- in reality, the most incredible machine that we have is this one right here, the one that we drive every single day throughout the course of our lifetimes. And so it's very, very important that we know how this works. And I think that understanding that we are an infinity valued logic based m- mechanism is really, really important to understand. So one of the big questions is, are we an animal? Is man an animal or is man something more? And I, this is something that's, I've thought about a lot since I was a kid. It was, uh, you know, are we just simply a, um, a series of, uh, uh, responses to outward stimuli or do we have control over our own, our own destiny? Are we, uh, a spiritual being, uh, inhabiting a body or are we, you know, a series of chemicals that have reactions that create consciousness? So the big question is, are you an animal or are you something more? There's two schools of thought on this. And obviously, there's probably many other you know, opinions about it, probably as as as, uh, as infinite as the universe is. There are probably opinions about whether or not, uh, you know, there's a spiritual nature, an animal nature to man and how, how that uh, interaction works. But really, when it boils down to it, there's really just two. And I'm actually in the middle of writing a book, and this is one of the chapters that uh, is is uh, in the book. Uh, and and the the big question is is that on one hand you have um, the the theory that uh, people are simply an accumulation of chemicals that are having chemical reactions all the time, and that these chemical reactions um, create consciousness. And this created consciousness from these chemical reactions. Uh, Once the chemical reactions stop, that's death, and then there's no more. And this is something that you could see in uh, smaller single-celled animals and uh, life forms. And you can see this in actually other uh, much higher uh, level life forms is that they seem to be having some chemical reactions. And then next thing you know, they're dead and there's nothing more. But the way I see it, and this is an, another uh, sort of way of looking at it, is that there's a spirit, a spiritual being that is uh, moving and animating the body. And this seems to be a much more logical take uh, on the entire uh, entirety of human existence. And uh, there's a really, really fantastic video of uh, a, actually a young girl her name is China McLean, and she talks about, um, you know, the existence of God and the law of cause and effect. It is an absolutely incredible video. I'm going to link to it in uh, the uh, in the notes below. But here's the way that I look at it. We're going to use a car as an analogy. A car is simply a hunk of metal and machines and computers that are put together, and uh, it mobilizes and it drives around and all that kind of stuff. But Really, if there's no driver, what happens to the car? It simply sits there. If there's never a driver, that car will sit. You've seen some of these, uh, you know, barn discoveries of, uh, of of high performance cars that just sit there. And what do they do? They naturally decay. It isn't until someone moves into it, until an actual person moves into the car and then understands how to use it and then takes care of it that that car has any value or usefulness. Otherwise, it really is just a hunk of metal that will decay. And over a long period of time, it will return back to its uh, you know, native form 
of, uh, you know, of, of atoms and molecules, eventually it will just disintegrate over many thousands of years. But on the other hand, you know, you look at it and um, you, and that car really does need a driver. And so the, the body that we occupy is really just what? It's just like the car. And you could have a blue car and you can have a red car. And this is the fun, this is the thing that kind of cracks me up. People say, oh, I, you know, I hate myself. I hate myself. It, dude, you can't really hate yourself because you, it's like you're, it's just your car. You know, like you wouldn't hate yourself if you had to drive a red car around, you know. And so this is uh, one of the things that I think about is like, you know, the car has no driver the same way that a, a, a body without life has no driver, has no animation, has nothing that is moving it, uh, you know, through existence. And so what happens is that it eventually decays. So let's look at another uh, aspect of it. So this, if if we're saying that this quantum computer, this 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 avatar, this tool, this this tool, this chess piece that we're moving through uh, the universe in, uh, is uh, is is like a computer. I have this really interesting thought about life imitating art, imitating life, and this endless circle regarding computers and augmented reality and uh and uh, virtual reality and what i was thinking about was if you were to design uh, a game and and by the way I, this is i don't mean to feed into uh you know the the thought concept that we are uh, living in a simulation but um if you were to, to design a video game what are we what are we trying to do if you're tr trying to design the perfect video game like the matrix you know what would you do you would have a you would have a means of storing data and uh that would be nearly unlimited amounts of information that would it would be there would be no end to the amount of information well that's very similar to the cloud today is that it seemingly has no limitation of information that's available. You know, you keep uploading songs, you keep, you know, creating files. It seems like, you know, I, I heard a statistic that 500 hours of new information, of new video is uploaded to YouTube every single minute. That's incredible. So going back to this analogy, you know, what would a single memory you know how much information would that encompass and if you just were to like you know starting right now you just blink and open your eyes and blink for like one second you know just look around your environment for just a second wherever you are there's a lot of different things number one there's heat you're measuring temperature you're measuring pressure you're measuring you know the amount of light there's sound all right, there's all these different sensations. There's, you know, there's the, the, uh, the, like the feeling of gravity, you know, the, the, the way that your body feels, how you're moving, you know, whether you're hot, whether you're cold, you know, there's like all of these sensory perceptions that are happening right now. And I just want you to think about all of the data points, the smells, the touches, the heat, the light, the various nuances, the total amount of color in one single moment of time. I don't know. I would probably guess that it, that in literally in one second, there would probably be about, I don't know, 30 terabytes of data in one second. You know, someone once brought up, oh, you know what? There's, you know, it's in your cells. You know, it's like your cells are the things that store the information. Do you know how ridiculous that sounds? That is totally not possible because here's the thing. If someone lost their arms and legs, then that would mean that they would lose memory too, but they don't. They don't lose any memory because, and the cells, don't tell me that there's like this a redundant, uh, you know, array where the cells now can recreate the information. That would be a grotesquely inefficient system if that was the way that it was supposed to work. So what I would talk about this is because we have, it just like you know if you you look at uh the the concept of cloud computing 
you know, whether it be Amazon Web Services or Google or any of these various, you know, web hosts and stuff like that. You have a computing system that is extremely powerful. And by the way, this the one single human mind is probably a more powerful computer than all the computers combined, you know, and um, and so that's one thing is that, you know, you've got uh, uh, memory, um, which is nearly unlimited. Um, you've got, if you think about it, going back, you can think of all these different memories. You can think of different memories and just pull them out of nowhere, you know, and just think back to something that was, that made you happy when you were a kid, a birthday or, you know, hanging out with a best friend or, you know, a favorite meal or, uh, you know, a time that you had a really good nap, uh, you know, another time that you went swimming. There's all these different memories that instantaneously you can pull. And so I just think about that and I go, man. There's no computer system that is as efficient and um, powerful with amounts of unlimited amounts of storage. And, you know, and obviously with with physical degradation, there's going to be things that are going to prevent you from being able to interface that. But, uh, you know, like things like Alzheimer's and dementia and so forth. But in reality, you know, if this is the the body and the mind is just a collection of pictures Okay, it still boils down to the fact that there is an operator inside there. There's an operator that's moving. If I say, hey, move your move your hand right up, move your other hand up, close your eyes, you know, spin around in your chair. There's still an operator that's doing those things, and that's you. Okay. And so this is this is how I see things is that human beings are perfect. Okay. But information leads to conclusions. And what do I mean by that? is that um, this is something that I learned in uh, when I was studying to be a computer programmer, is that garbage in equals garbage out. And so even though we are a perfect computing machine, right, we have all this capability of nearly unlimited storage, we have nearly unlimited computing power, you know, and there's some great stories about, uh, you know, you look at some of these uh, kids that they just, they, they're prodigies. Um, that have unlimited ability, you know, for things like music, they have perfect pitch. It, it's the same physical form, you know, that we're all given. It's just that they have, uh, you know, a skill set in being able to use it that most people don't have. But where does that skill set come from? Another one, another great example uh, that some of you guys might have heard before was uh, Mary Lou Henner. Have you ever heard of Mary Lou Henner? She can recall with perfect clarity, right? everything that's ever happened to her down to a headline that she read in the news, you know, 50 years ago, or, uh, you know, a line uh, in uh, the show that she was on taxi in the 70s, uh, to what she ate for breakfast on a particular day, she has perfect recall of every single thing that's ever happened to her. So what does that mean? That means that we're all capable of that. If one person demonstrates that it can be done, then everybody has the capability of being able to do it. And so the problem is, is that there's a lot of times that we think about things that, um, that uh, uh, decisions, like, I don't know if you've ever been around someone that uh, gets down on themselves, that they tell themselves, man, you're just not good enough. You know, you're not good enough to get that job. You're not good enough to, you know, to, uh, to have a relationship with that person. You're not good enough to be able to be successful. There's a lot of this negative self-talk. And can you imagine how much we tell people it's like, well, I could never have a memory like that. I don't have the skill set to be able to do the. It's almost reflexive the negative things that we tell ourselves, and so. Um, but where does all this come from? It's again, it's garbage in equals garbage out, and once you start to realize that you need to be able to, um, you know, to protect yourself from those types of thought processes, the next thing you know, you can be much more powerful and much more efficient. To be honest. Uh, in your execution of ideas and thoughts and and uh, being able to get uh, productivity done and to become more efficient. And I think that that is very, very exciting. I think that most people don't even realize how powerful they are. And I think that um, just having the realization that, oh my gosh, you know what, you're right. I am a very powerful person and I am able to do these things. And, you know, I have the power of choice and I can, and, and, and I have nearly unlimited capacity in order to be able to do things. Every single person is imbued with that. But the problem is, is that we all have this garbage that we're fed. And so it jams up our programming. It literally puts us in a position where the way that our operating system is, is getting jammed up 
with ideas of, you know, unworthiness and poor self-worth, poor self-esteem. And uh, that's, uh, that is really um, something that you need to inoculate yourself from is, is from uh, the, the mind virus of self-invalidation. And I think that it's really, really important to at least be able to identify it. And so um, I think that that's one of the things that we'll probably explore on this and other episodes. So anyway, another idea that I had, and this is just really, a, you know, sort of a, a fantastical look at uh, existence is what if uh, you were to switch bodies with someone else? You know, there's been lots of shows and movies and stuff like that about, you know, body swap movies. But if that were the case, you know, like Freaky Friday and all these different types of things. But if you were to swap bodies, and I just want you to give the snap answer. If you were to swap bodies with somebody else, right, uh, would you be able to, to drive that body, you know? And so think about it for a second. You know, it's like you can raise your arm. You can raise your arm. We already did this. You can, you know, swivel around in your chair. You can kick out your feet. You can do whatever you want to do. But the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that if you were suddenly switched with another person, you would be able to drive that body, no problem. It, I mean, because you know how to do it already. You know, it's something that's inherent uh, to the way that it works. And, you know, barring any physical capabilities or, you know, physical handicap handicaps or, or uh, you know, damage to one's actual physical being, um, you would be able to, you know, drive that body doing, you know, pretty well, you know, and uh, like, for example, let's say that you were to body swap with Shaquille O'Neal, right? I think that would be pretty weird. But you know, the fact of the matter is, is that he'd probably be pretty mad to be, uh, you know, to take over your you know, short body that's probably not in that good of shape and whatnot. I'm just kidding. But, uh, you know, now all of a sudden you've got this, uh, you know, you're driving around this seven foot, you know, whatever monster truck, you know, beast of a body. You could still do it. You could still put one foot in front of the other. It'd probably just, you have to get your bearings for a second. But in reality, you would be able to do it. So what is the thing that makes every single person unique? Well, I want you to think about this for a second. What's the one thing that makes you different from all of the, I, I heard this recently, that there's been 100 billion people have existed since the beginning of the human race. There have been 100 billion people have existed, uh, you know, throughout history. From the very dawn of time, you know, from the beginning of, of, of humankind, a hundred billion souls have walked this uh, uh, this earth, right? And the thing that makes every single one of them unique is their own personal point of view. No one else on the planet has your set of experiences and the way of looking at the world, which makes you very, very unique. And every single person that's ever existed before us, they each had their own point of view. They had their own experiences. They had their own ways of looking at things they have their own hopes and dreams their wishes their you know families the things that they wanted to be able to do all of the 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 their skill sets and uh, things that they enjoy and it's all because of what their own personal point of view that's the thing that that makes us very unique is our own individual point of view no one else on the planet has the same experiences and point of view that you have What's another way that we can really get the best out of ourselves understanding now that we've got this, you know, physical being and we've got this operating system that's based on an infinity valued logic uh, structure, right? Well, the, the way that we are taught how to get the most out of an infinity value logic system is um, and the way I look at this is when do we get our operating system installed? Well, our operating system gets installed when we are kids from the very second that we are out of the womb. And, you know, some say even before that. We start having memories and we start having, you know, interactions and there's things that start to formulate 
even at a very basic level, the ways that we, we react to things, you know? And so you start having these memories and you start having these experiences, you start having these conclusions. And then all through those formative years, the mistakes that you make as a, as a kid, the information that you wind up accumulating, the knowledge that you get, the books that you read, the people that you interact with, every one of the, you know, the, the, the stimulus that you receive allows you to create this, this environment, this operating system upload that's putting you in a position where you go, good, now I have enough experience that I can start making the correct conclusions and decisions that will result in the maximum capacity for survival uh, for me during the course of my life. And so if that's the case that you have this machine that you are the driver of, that you're you have during that period of time from birth until you know probably into your mid 20s is this time period where you're uploading your operating system and getting the experiences you need in order to be able to maximize survival potential well what are some of the things that wind up jamming you up well this is another concept in computers that really uh i thought was a, a wonderful analogy and that concept is latency latency and why is this such an important concept um, to, th to think about? Well, what is latency? Latency is the lag that it takes for a piece of information to go from where it is, you know, on, so let's say, in a storage device like a hard disk or in the cloud, for it to go through the processing mechanism and then to come back to, you know, to you so that you can make a decision. So latency... Latency is the length of time that it takes for a piece of information to go from the storage device, whether it's the cloud or a hard drive or whatever, all the way to the processing unit for that information to be absorbed and then a decision to be made, okay? This is the reason why, in my opinion, drugs of any type are very, very dangerous because it, it, and especially for, for some of the drugs that are out there, that drugs inherently inhibit your latency, your ability to draw information and make a conclusion. Drugs gum up that mechanism. They put you in a position where you, and, and this is the insidious thing about drugs. And by the way, you can do whatever you want to do. That's, I think, one of the great things is that we have the power of choice. We have the, the freedom to make decisions of what we want to be able to do. But I will tell you this right now. My personal choice is that I would never want to be able to do something that is going to affect my latency and my ability to come to conclusions quickly. Because why? In any capacity, that's going to diminish my potential for survival. But this is the insidious thing about uh, things like uh, drugs and alcohol. You know, I occasionally will have a drink from time to time but it's not something that is a, a habitual thing. And the reason being is because drugs and alcohol wind up affecting your latency and it also muddies up your perceptions, which means that it also skews the data. It skews the information that you're bringing in. And so how could it be that if you're, if you're, if we're talking about garbage in equals garbage out and the information that you're bringing in winds up being altered, either through, you know, a, a perception or a wrong conclusion, then the the conduct that you're going to have, regardless of your best intentions, regardless of how you, it makes you feel, you're going to wind up having an output that is less than optimal. And so, and this is the, the, the insidious thing about drugs and alcohol, is it makes you feel that your output is at a completely optimal, if not even super optimal level, meaning that you are performing at a much higher level with drugs and alcohol than you would be without. And so that's up to you. If that's the way that you want to be able to conduct your life, that's completely fine. But my argument is that anything that affects your latency and it makes it slower for you to receive information and then make those conclusions and accurately process that with full, you know, awareness of what it is that you're concluding and how and understanding the mechanism of how you 
come to or draw those conclusions, I don't think that it's something that is useful to you, you know? And so to me, I would just be like, you know what? Anything that's going to diminish my computing power, right? Anything that's going to skew my point of view, I'm not going to do those types of things, right? Regardless, especially for things like drugs that have a psychotropic nature, meaning that it literally alters your mind, then what happens is that if you look at it, you're shuffling into the deck of, of information. You're shuffling in a whole bunch of skewed pictures, which are just going to mean that you're, the information that you're getting is just going to bring you to poor conclusions. And so I think that this is an important piece of it because you know society as a whole right now, people are very dependent on drugs and they're very dependent on alcohol. It makes them feel good. It gives them a false impression of of what uh, of of uh, something that is a uh, it's it's a feigned survival mechanism. And when I say feigned, it's a fake. It's a fake survival mechanism that makes you think that you're increasing your survival when you're actually diminishing it. Perfect example is if you like, would you ever want to jump in a car with someone that was drunk, like like completely out of their mind, drunk, or completely stoned? Right? Would you would you would you uh, entrust someone? to uh who's who's completely stoned to plan your wedding let's say right would you want to drive around for any length of time with someone who is completely inebriated the answer to those questions is, is absolutely not but have you ever really thought about why yeah of course there's going to be personal danger but that person may be one of the smartest most brilliant people but the fact of the matter is, is that their ability to receive information and draw conclusions has been affected. And that unfortunately is the way that that all drugs wind up doing that. And um, and so I in just my opinion, the higher level of, uh, you know, survival capability would be that through exercise of discipline and uh, self-awareness would wind up leading you into a position where you could have the maximal survival capabilities without the dependence uh, on uh, on uh, outside substances. So let's summarize everything up to this point. So, so we've drawn the conclusion that someone is driving the body, okay? That someone is you. The body's just the vehicle. It's how you interact in this plane of existence, whatever that means to you, okay? Somewhere there's storage, and there's lots of information that you've accumulated. It's near. It's in nearly, you know, theoretically, it seems to be nearly unlimited in its capa capacity. <clears throat> you know, someone brought up to me once that a single, like one twenty fifth of a second of, uh, you know, of of information in a picture has so much data that it would be crushing to try and put that much data with our current computer systems, there's there's just, there's no way that you could get a picture that is that clear, you know? Now you can have a reasonable facsimile, which you, oh wow, that looks pretty clear, but it still comes far short. I mean, think about the, for the, the, the fact that your eyes can have darkness and light and varying levels of light and it all adjusts. I mean, it's just in, an incredible machine that we have, right? And which by the way, if you were, let me ask you, if we were designing a machine, because people say, oh, this was a, this body was a, a, you know, it's a, it's just a, it's just a, it's, it's evolution. It's just a, a luck of the draw. You know, it's just, we've evolved this way from mud to mankind. That is, I, I said, that's the most ridiculous thing because why? If we're constantly, think about what we do is that we are are constantly trying to design things like ourselves. We design robots that are like us. We design computing systems to think like us. We design things, you know, um, <clears throat> everything that we design is based on this form factor. If you were to design the perfect artificial intelligence robot, it would be what? Another human being. Seriously, that's what it would be. So to think that we were not, you know, that these this form factor wasn't something that someone uh, designed and uh, created, it, it's it it actually kind of defies logic, 
hey, listen, I'm not here to dictate uh, you know, your conclusions or what you should think about any of these types of things. That's 100% not for me to say. But these are just my thoughts. And my goal is always what? To help bring us into a position where we can function better in our lives, that we can make our dreams and goals come true, and that we can have an increased survival capacity. I mean, that's really why I'm doing this channel. And so I think it's important to actually sit down and think about the machine that we have at our fingertips that we control this, this uh, again, this chess piece that's on the game board of life, what, how does it work? What are the pieces, right? And so we need to start asking ourselves these questions and uh, figure out ways to, uh, <clears throat> you know, upgrade. Going back to the summary. So somebody's driving the body. We know that, right? That's you. There's an interface, okay? I saw someone post a picture of a brain the other day, and I was like, look, that's just the interface. You, wherever you are, are pushing information and conclusions, telling this thing to do its thing, right? The brain is really a switchboard. Uh, there is a system in place, meaning an operating system, and it's based on a uh, an infinity value logic system to where you can hold multiple conclusions at one time. And uh, the thing that makes you, uh, you totally unique from everyone else is your personal point of view and the way that you look at things, okay? So I want to reiterate, we are, I'm not saying in a new easier form that we're in the matrix, okay? But what we are in is we are in life. And the entire point is to be able to have something that we enjoy doing and to be able to survive and to be able to, uh, you know, to uh, bring an increased capacity to survive to the people that are around us and the people that we consider to be, you know, our teammates moving forward, whether it's family, it's friends or coworkers, whatever, right? We wanna be able to increase the survival capacity. I think that's a pretty good purpose all the way around, you know? So I'm just making observations about these different types of things and, and things that I see that, you know, we have in common. So as I said earlier, we're, we have our operating system and it's installed from, you know, from when we're born, and again, arguably from before we're born, we're already starting to groove in the information and draw conclusions about our, you know, what we're capable of doing. And, uh, you know, so that's, that happens, you know, before the womb, and then we start to increase exponentially our data intake from when we're born all the way through school. That period of time from you know 18 to 25 or sorry from from birth to age 25 i think that's the maximal learning time <clears throat> is when you're going to get the information and by the way this this is why it's very very important to be cautious of the information that you're taking in right you look at the types of things that people are studying today and look at anything that diminishes one's belief in oneself or one's capabilities that's jammed up gunk that's going to get in your operating system and make you draw some very, very poor conclusions, okay? So education, right, is vitally important. You know, the ability to read, the ability to think, the ability to draw conclusions, right? Basic math skills, understanding those sort of things are very, very important in order to be able to what? Survive in this world, okay? Um, and so that's why we need to take very good care of the things that we let into our mind. Okay. So we talked about it before is like having a virus that in, infiltrates your mind and messes up the way that you're thinking the same way that it would in a computer is, and I'll, and I'll give you an example. Can one word, can a single word mess up your whole day, right? Can it mess up your whole existence? Can a single word trigger you and send you completely insane absolutely okay and uh, a, a case in point if i say trump a bunch of people are going to lose their minds if i say biden a bunch of other people are going to lose their minds that's literally one set of syllables and you know 90 percent of america just lost their mind by just saying one of those two words okay just an assembly of noises causes completely insane reactions from you know most of the people in America today which is hilarious okay and so this is why we need to manage the flood of information that is going in to uh you know to our storage banks because it just puts us in a position where we can't make the right decisions and by the way 
we're going to be going through in some upcoming and subsequent episodes, we're going to be going through some really, really cool stuff of how to actually identify and eliminate, uh, you know, some of the things that are gumming up our system, you know, how to do a comparative analysis, what do you do in the face of a confusion, right? Because that's really what it is, is that when you have a confusion and things are not resolving, you it's, it's just that you've got some gummed up piece of information that's just messing you up. And so how do you pull that apart and then get back on, you know, with your life? One of the things that we need to do is we need to learn how to um, evaluate the relative importance of things, like how important is this thing, you know, and versus other pieces of information, right? Like what's the order of like what is important, okay? You know, I had a conversation with, uh, with, uh, with a really good friend of mine and he was, you know, and this is when we were much younger, he wanted to drop out of high school. You know, he's like, I don't think I'm going to be needing any of this stuff. You know, this is not what I want to do. And I just feel like I would rather go live life. And I try to tell him, look, I think it's going to be important. Education, blah, blah, blah. But in all honesty, he's become very, very successful and dropped out. I don't know. He's like 16 or something like that. And just said, I'm just going to go, go live life. I'm going to do the things that I want to do. And I look at that now and I go, man, what a, he was not only was he brave, but I think it was actually the smarter thing to, for him to have done. I think that there's some merits to being able to finish high school, but you know, there's less and less important today than it has been in the past, you know, especially with, you know, the efficiency and the results that I think that a lot of schools are getting is very, very poor right now. And I think that that's something that's important is, is that, you know, I live by the philosophy that only results count and I'm trying to create efficiencies in my existence. And so that's just, uh, you know, something that I think is important. Another thing that's important is that we're not taught how to think. And so um, I feel like the concept of of uh, of critical thinking, uh, and, I, and I've mentioned this before, but the concept of critical thinking is really kind of ridiculous because what is critical thinking? It's just when you really break it down, it's, uh, you know, criticism of something and finding the things that are at fault with it in order to be able to, uh, you know, potentially figure out what you can do or draw a conclusion based upon the faults of something. Uh, I think that a better, more powerful uh, tool is deductive reasoning. Okay, deductive reasoning looks at both sides of, you know, a problem and says, well, what are the positives and what are the negatives? And let's look at some of the things that we can wind up extrapolating in order for us to reason our way out of this jam and figure out how we can draw conclusions Based upon positive information and negative information, what are the things that we can synthesize in order to be able to help us draw the correct conclusions? And so I really think that, uh, you know, more so than the concept of critical thinking, I think that uh, we need to return to, uh, you know, powerful and uh, encourage uh, deductive reasoning as uh, as uh, part and parcel of our uh, operating system upgrades uh, as we're uh, uh, going through the installation process from when we're born to, you know, when we're in our early 20s. I think that's important. And, uh, you know, and, and we really need that deductive reasoning so that we can know what path to go down. I had a situation where, um, you know, I, was, I went to the dentist and um, I had a, not my current dentist, this is like several dentists ago. And, um, and, and the dentist told me, uh, they said, um, you know, we really think that, that you should, uh, we want to um, give you a crown. And uh, I said, well, what does that entail? She said, well, what, what it's going to tell is, is we're going to have to grind down your tooth to a little nub. And then we're going to create a little piece that's going to, you know, simulate your tooth. And then uh, we're going to slap that on there, uh, you know, with some porcelain and, you know, adhesives and a bunch of stuff. And, uh, you know, and then it's going to be your new tooth and it's going to protect what you've got. I said, can I ask you a question? And she said, yeah. And I said, um, if I, if, if the tooth that I have right now, so there's nothing more, um, there, there's nothing with more integrity than the tooth that I have right now. Is that true? And I said, yeah, yeah you're correct. And I said, so what you're telling me is that based upon, and what it was is that they wanted to give me a crown because I had a, um, what's called a craze line, which is basically, you know, it's, it's something that could lead to something worse, but it's basically a cosmetic line on the tooth that could develop into something, but it really wasn't anything at the moment. But I said, we want to carve that whole thing out, take it out, and then slap on something else. And I said, but isn't it true that no matter how technology is advanced and all this, 
that's still not going to be as strong as the tooth that my body created, true or false? And they said, you're correct. And so I said, so let me ask you another question. If I could have the percentage of my tooth, if we could keep a higher percentage of my natural tooth, then wouldn't that be stronger than the artificial tooth that you're putting on? And the dentist looked at me and said, well, your reasoning is correct. And I said, why don't we do this? I'm not trying to tell you how to do your job, but let me ask you a question. If we just superficially got rid of that line just to the point where we were going to have, uh, you know, an increased amount of integrity of the tooth, but getting rid of that piece, which was causing, you know, a little bit of the degradation and then just putting a filling on top of that, but I got to keep a majority of the tooth. Would that be a better solution to in order to be able to keep the integrity? And they said, you know what? We can't see the, uh, the problem with your logic. Your logic is sound. And I said, great. Now, it, the added benefit was that the procedure that they want to do was $3,500. The procedure that I wound up getting done was $600. And I was like, you know, so I saved $2,900, you know, by having deductive reasoning and not listening to, you know, people uh, that were authorities in an area, but having communication and being able to help them to see the things that I was seeing, even though I'm not a professional. I'm not a dentist. I don't have anything to know about that. But what I do know is that the integrity of a tooth is is stronger. The natural tooth is stronger than any man-made uh, patch that was going to be put on. That's just 100% true. So this is why deductive reasoning is incredibly important, is being able to have an interactive conversation in order to be able to get the best solutions that you will require in order to be able to increase your survival capacity throughout life. So it's important to know the tools that we've been given, right? It's important to understand what it is, the great gifts that we have at our disposal, especially things like the power of choice, deductive reasoning, all these different types of things. Don't make the the car the more important thing. You know, if I were, if I were to ask you, you know, to to close your eyes, right? And just think to yourself, you know, what color am I? You know, you think of, of what you go, well, me, the driver of this machine, you know, whatever this machine is, you're the driver. You don't have a color. You don't have a gender. You don't have any of these types of things, right? And so I think that that is really, really important. You know, you got given, you know, a blue car or a red car. That's what you got, right? But that doesn't define who you are. You know, and so I think that that's really important is don't don't make the the car, you know, and in this in this instance, we're talking about, you know, the the chess piece that you're driving around. Don't make it more important than the game. It's really not. OK, it's just uh, the the uh, the objective uh, reality uh, game piece that you're uh, in the game of life in. And so don't make it more important than that. It's really not. OK, the most important thing is the driver. So what if the car breaks down? You know, well, this is one of the reasons why you want to take good care of yourself. You know, and this is one of the reasons why you want to take care of the foods that you eat. You want to take care of the fact that you get enough rest. You want to make sure that you're getting exercise, that you're getting sun, right? Because why this helps keep your chest piece, the data input device in the best shape possible you know, so that you don't have a degradation, whether it's hearing or vision or strength or whatever, you want to be able to keep this machine in as good a condition as it is, as it can be. Why? Because this machine is the data input device that allows you to receive the information that you will have in order to be able to draw conclusions and make decisions. And anything, again, anything that degrades the ability for you to receive information in order to be able to process should be discarded. Anything that diminishes that capability should be discarded. And so this is why I encourage people, don't do drugs, don't do things that are not gonna put you in a good position to be healthy, don't eat junky foods, you know, get some exercise, all these things that will increase your survival capacity just allow you to make sure that your data input device <laughs> is in tip top shape. So in conclusion of today's episode, I just want to leave you with this one thought. 
that we are perfect and we are good. That human beings are perfect and we're and are good. However, the information that we receive allows us to draw poor conclusions and all of the information, every data receptor that we wind up receiving puts us in a position where we can make poor decisions. You know, we're always right. As a computing device, the evidence is 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 uh, far in support of the fact that as a computing device, right, as a pure, simple computer of which the human, human body is not, the, the ability to draw conclusions is flawless. However, the information is what's flawed. Do what you can in order to keep your information and your input as flaw-free as possible, you know, flawless as possible. And, uh, you know, and just remember that, that, uh, that you're a good person, okay? And, and by the way, this is, this is a, a different topic for a different day. You know, are there bad people that are out there? In my opinion, what, are, what is every bad person trying to do? Every bad person is trying to survive. Even the people that you don't like, the people that have wronged you, why did they do what they did? It's because they're just trying to survive and get by in this little, you know, this chessboard called life. They had some ideas of what they did would be the right thing to do, and it was the wrong thing, right? And But what, what happened, it was just based on the information. Their goal is still the same, right? Their goal is to increase their, their ability to survive and do well in life. That's everybody's decision. They make those decisions, you know, on that. Um, but even though people are, are individually, they're good, we can make bad decisions and we can badly influence those around us. And so that's also part of our responsibility is to make sure that we're doing good things in order to be able to positively affect people that are out there. Okay. And so last thing is, is that you also need to know how to inoculate yourself against the bad information. If you feel like there's something that doesn't make any sense, I tell you, you know, I've had had arguments with people and they actually wind up contradicting themselves. I'm like, have you really thought this all the way through? You know, like your conclusions don't sound like you spent any time actually thinking this through, you know, and I wind up having like even reasonable conversations with folks and like punching holes through their logic just because they're they don't take the time to actually think through you know, their patterns of thought and what they're thinking and the conclusions that they're drawing and seeing conflicting information. And well, if this thing conflicts with this, then one of these has to be wrong, right? And I always go, look, if something is conflicting, I'm willing for either side, for myself or you to be wrong, I'm willing to be able to figure out until I come to a draw a conclusion that is empirically and objectively true. And so as long as we're willing to do that, you know, this leads to what having an open mind and also being able to, you know, make sure that you've got great data input in order to be able to draw those conclusions that are going to increase your survival. So with that being said, just remember, you're perfect, you're awesome. You know, let's get out there and make the world a better place. I appreciate you joining me today. And, uh, you know, come back, make sure that you subscribe, make sure that you like, make sure that you, uh, you know, uh, ring the notification bell. So we make sure that you can keep in touch with you. I'm going to be doing more expansion of, uh, you know, of, of different social media uh, fronts in order to be able to get out there. And, uh, you know, I'm glad that we're going to get some momentum going here uh, into the rest of the year. And uh, just thank you for spending a little bit of time with me. Take care. Have a great day. Thanks for tuning in to The Culmination. Bye.